Hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Healthy Dose. This is a podcast about current trends in healthcare. I'm your host, Kim Douglas. So today we're going to discuss supportive care for cancer patients. Now, we all know that cancer changes us physically, but what about the way it changes us mentally? I'm excited to have with me here today, Dr. Shanti Gowri Nathan. Welcome to the show. We're so happy that you're here today, and we have some really interesting things to talk about. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Um, Let's start out with a few questions. So I said when we were first talking about interviewing you, what is psycho-oncology and what is your role at St. John's? So um, psycho-oncology as a field is it's kind of all encompassing. It's sort of an interdisciplinary field looking at the intersection of the mind, the body, um, the symptoms that patients have when they're going through cancer treatment and after treatment um, and how that sort of affects the rest of us. Not only, um, you know, how our body's feeling, but how our brain is feeling, how our cognition is, um, you know, are we sleeping at night? And then really looking at the larger picture of the wellness of the patient as a whole. Sure, that's so important, the whole, you yeah. know, not just treating wherever the disease is. Supportive services, it seems like it's pretty new. So does every hospital have this? Um, so yes, s- s- cancer support services in and of itself is a concept that's only come into being in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and no, every hospital doesn't have it, but they probably should. should. So St. John's has a comprehensive cancer support service program. Let's talk about the interdisciplinary and cohesive treatment approach that your team takes. So our larger team, um, we are called Cancer Support Services, and um, I'm the director of that team. And uh, we are really blessed. Um, We have a lot of support from the hospital and the foundation, and we are able to provide patients with um, services that they otherwise don't always get or aren't eligible for just based on cancer treatment and insurance. Um, And that includes things like nutrition, rehab, palliative care, pain management. Um, We have a lovely spiritual care chaplaincy program. Um, And uh, I think um, one of the really nice things is that we have in-house social workers who do both psychotherapy, but also sort of the nitty gritty of, of what needs to happen, logistics of, of treatment. Right. Um, and then we have uh, myself. I am a, a psycho-oncologist, so a cancer psychiatrist. I, I trained originally um, as an MD. I trained in psychiatry, and then I specialized in um, what's essentially medical psychiatry. So um, the two sort of really big uh, components of that in cancer are women's psychiatry, reproductive psychiatry, because hormones play such a huge role. And then also um, our uh, cancer psychiatry, just understanding where the cancer is, what the treatment is, and how are we going to um, deal with the symptoms that are caused by the cancer and the treatment. Right. I feel like you've kind of already answered this because I wanted to know, besides the psycho-oncology, what other resources, but you kind of went into that. And I know personally, I took advantage of the chaplain and took advantage of your social services. So that is the other resources that are available, correct? Um, Yeah, uh, we're actually, we've we've really built out the program. I think you said that you came here and were with us four years ago. So from that time to this, we've really sort of focused on the kinds of programming that patients ask for. Right. Um, And that includes things like um, support groups, um, you know, services for caregivers, because the caregivers go through a lot of what the patient's going through in terms of uh, the emotional import. Um, And we've got more services in terms of grief and loss, um, especially post-COVID. And now we've got um, webinars and uh, we try and do little events for each month, each cancer, um, you know, when we're talking about how to raise awareness and money for different kinds of cancer research. That is so great. It Mm -hmm. really, really is. Um, So why is it so important to introduce yourself to the patient as early as diagnosis? So Mm -hmm. not once you're in it and you're already taking care of them. Why? Why so early? Um, Well, it doesn't have to be, right? Like, I think the really important thing to recognize, you know, people 
you know, when I go to a party or something and people ask what you do, they'll say, oh, but when you have cancer, aren't you supposed to be depressed? Um, aren't you supposed to be anxious? Um, and, and maybe you are supposed to react and you are supposed to have feelings about what's going on. Um, but what we're looking for is any time really on the cancer journey where the things that we are feeling and um, sort of what is going on with us is actually affecting either the cancer care or our ability to function, right? So the alarm bell is always going to be, no matter where in the journey, is is it affecting your ability to function the way you want to? And mm -hmm. if it is, we'd like to talk about it. For sure. So this is something very near and dear to my heart as well. What does nutrition have to do with cancer? Yeah, so... um I guess the short answer is everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think uh, um, what we do to rebuild ourselves um, is all things that we probably know we should be doing no matter what, all of us know, but it becomes so essential for us to pay attention and do those things when we're recovering from cancer. And nutrition is a huge part of that because we're trying to heal the body. And in order to heal the body, we have to put things into it that are going to support that. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are certain cancers where the treatments and or the cancer itself um, create very special and very important nutritional requirements for the patients. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was diagnosed, as you said, um, four years ago with breast cancer, um, interestingly enough, the irony was that I was on a television show where I was the positivity, um, happiness, funny, uh, beauty expert every okay. day. Um, I was fighting stage 3B cancer and mm. going through chemo. So here's what I would do. I would go in my room at night. I would go in my room. I would pull the drapes. I would. It would be dark. I would just sit in my bed with the covers pulled over my head. My husband would be at the door crying. And, um, and then I would get up and I would put on my mask and be like, hi, how are you? Now I'm on camera. So it was very ironic, the two ways that I dealt with it. But my question to you is that people assume after you have cancer that you're just supposed to deal with it. And the answer is no, I'm assuming. Talk about how depression affects patients and how I almost compartmentalized it. Like here I was depressed, but then here I wasn't. Okay, first of all, <laughs> if we didn't have all this stuff, I would have to give you a hug. I'm so sorry that you had to go through that like that. Thank you. Um, and again, this goes back to um, how we approach surviving cancer, going through treatment. Um, I think there's still some stigma left over from back in the day when cancer wasn't as treatable. People didn't talk about it much. It wasn't something that um, we could do much about. Um, but now I think it's very important to be proactive and understand that um, serious illness and having our mortality sort of shoved in our face for a second there, no matter whether it's stage one or stage four or, or, or where we are in our journey, um, it has an impact on how we interact with ourselves and the world. So um, either we can acknowledge that, sort of own it, seek help if we need it, or um, yeah, absolutely, you can compartmentalize and we can maybe be in a bit of denial. And um, you know, all of that is coping too. And I think the day comes where we want to reckon with it and we want to put it in its place. Um, depression and anxiety are just the furthest part of the spectrum. They are the part where clinically now the brain has said, okay, I'm, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but this is a chronic stress to me. I, ha I, I do not like this. Um, and the brain starts to struggle in terms of being able to provide us with the mood and the cognition and the sleep that we need. So I see that as sort of a biological sort of issue that happens, um, which is different from the layman's term of depression where we're crying because we're sad about something, right? But it's along the spectrum. So I think that um, we can get and need help anywhere along the spectrum. Once we get to depression and anxiety, we're really talking about clinical um, diagnoses that really do require medical treatment um, or they get worse. So, um, and you know, the one thing I tell patients is look, out of everything you're going through, depression and anxiety are highly treatable. That's 
the baggage that I can take off for you. That's the burden that you don't have to keep carrying. So why are we carrying it? Right. So um, and, you know, people don't want to take medication and I don't either. So but I think that when we're carrying all this other stuff, any bag that we can put down is important. So that's Very. that's what we try to do is is whatever we can take down for people we do. That is wonderful. And what a relief that would be if I had heard that, you know, that I can help you with it because you just kind of feel like, well, yeah, this is I my owe battle. you a hug later. Oh, <laughs> I, I will take that from you. Okay. I really will. So the latest buzz in alternative treatments is psychedelics. Yeah. Everybody's talking about psychedelics. So where do we stand on them? And what is the trip program? Okay. Um, Are we taking a trip? So, um, to start with, um, the psychedelic sort of renaissance that has come to us now, um, ha has really reached, um, layperson awareness now, right? Like yeah. it's in the New York times and, and it's on 60 minutes. I mean, I know my, my dad called me and said, I saw it on 60 minutes. And as far as he was concerned, that made it legitimate. Gave so, legitimacy, right. right. <laughs> um, for myself, um, I think that, uh, one of the reasons I was recruited here was to work on psychedelics in clinical trials. Um, there is a gentleman named Dr. Daniel Kelly, who is the head of Pacific Neuroscience Institute, and another really lovely doctor named Dr. Heinzerling, who's the head of the TRIP program. Um, the TRIP program being Treatment and Research in Psychedelics. Um, and um, I am the psychiatrist in the program. Um, Dr. Heinzling is an addiction doctor and a medicine doctor. Um, and, and the idea here is that um, the psychedelics may not be for everyone and they may not fix everything, but there's enough evidence that they do fix things that we should be looking into it. And um, for my patient population in particular, it's so important because patients are grappling with physical symptoms um, you know, maybe depression or anxiety, but there's also this larger sort of existential um, presence in the room, right? Like we're, we're talking about um, very serious illness and our mortality. Sometimes we're talking about dying um, and that's okay too. We talk about it. Um, but um, what the psychedelics do seem to do better than what we have now is making sense of things, right? Like how, how do we put all of this into our world? Like how does cancer fit in our world? How does, you know, having illness fit into our world? How do we make sense of the things that are happening to us and still feel like we're going to be okay? Right. And I think the essence of the human sort of experience is that life happens, bad things happen, but we have to be able to steady the boat and believe that we're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where psychedelics have potential where perhaps my medication right now doesn't, um, is, is that the That's, hope, right? Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that mine don't work because I'm really good at what I do <laughs> and they do work. Um, but this is a different modality. It's a different way of doing it. So the TRIP program right now, we are doing research in a psychedelics. Um, ketamine is already legal, but uh, the other psychedelics like psilocybin, and LSD, um, we're doing uh, clinical trials in those in the hopes that one day they will be um, tools that we can use. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. And I do think you're so right about when you said you have to believe that you're going to be okay. I don't. If I didn't have that strong belief and, and use my faith and my foundation, I, I just don't know how I would have gotten through it. So you're so yeah. right. We have to try anyway. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So how does your role, uh, depending on which patient population you're working with, how does it differ? Um, well, uh when you're working with the cancer patient population, I think that there's a little bit of a uh, heightened medical aspect to it because you're really paying attention to what's going on with cancer and treatment in the body. And uh, a lot of our psychiatric medications um, have the potential to interact. So you have to be really careful. Um, but actually that's not that different from what we do in other aspects of my job in, in terms of uh, the clinical trials in psychedelics. Um, again, the psychedelics have a sort of medical import to them and we're using doses that are fairly hefty. Um, so the understanding of what it's doing to the body is important and being able to monitor that. Um, what's the same across the board is that, um, 
you know, the real issue when it comes to a part of our life that's hard and us not coping is that we get stuck, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And being entrenched and, and behaviors that maybe worked for us at one point in our life but are now not working are are human experiences that sort of cross over no matter what the difficulty is, whether it's, you know, depression that's never lifted or cancer. So, and I actually don't know which one's worse in terms of um, the ability to treat that. I think that um, we have to sort of realize that no matter what, those are the areas where, um, whether it's psychedelics or it's traditional antidepressants, what we're really trying to do is help people to sort of get up and get moving again. Right. I know personally, when you were talking about the patterns that we need to Mm -hmm. kind of shift and that cancer makes you take a look at, you know, even just stress, how much stress, you know, Mm -hmm. I I was at 24 seven and you kind of step back and look at it and go, wow, this needs to change. Yeah. Stress is such a creepy thing. You know, it just kind of creeps into your life. um, And then you add a layer and you add a layer and you keep going. Um, I will say that we're very good at keeping going, but I don't know that it helps us much because I think there's um, times when um, we have to pay for all that. Right. So um, it's really great to be able to look at that and take some of that apart and take it down for people. Yeah. Now, how did you get into supportive services? Um, I actually uh, spent my last year of residency working in all of medical psych- psychiatry. So um, that includes um, working with patients on the inpatient medical floors, um, patients with complicated uh, medical illnesses have different needs psychiatrically. And then I specialized in women's psychiatry, reproductive psychiatry, which is um, just what hormones do to change what we do for psychiatry. Um, and then um, cancer really appealed to me because I found that in general psychiatry, it takes a very long time to really get to the heart of what's going on with people, which is natural, right? It's, yeah. it's not a normal thing to come and talk to a stranger. But um, there is something about cancer that makes people more open to really reassessing, looking at themselves, looking at their lives and changing something. So I get to be there for that window, for that moment where we're really ready to kind of be our best self and and change how we live. So it's really just the loveliest thing. It is. And and I've heard the term bantered around a lot about pivoting. And it seems like that's a really big pivot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you don't have to pivot completely, but I think we just become a little more aware. Uh, uh, we pay a little bit more attention to what we want and what we're doing. We're sure. Mm-hmm. Well, that's about all the time we have for today. Thank you, Dr. Gowrie Nathan. It was wonderful having you here and thank all you. of your great information. And we want to thank St. John's Health Center Foundation for making this podcast possible. And thank you for joining us today. So that's all. Thank you for joining us on Your Healthy Dose. Until next time.